Bhagavatam. This is a continuation of the pastime. Paranjana becomes a woman in his next life. This is an allegory. And Nara Muni is narrating this allegory. And he's speaking to one king, King Prachini Barhishat, who is very enthusiastic and also quite good at what we call fruit of activities sacrifice, karma kanda, and he's killed a lot of animals in this karma kanda sacrifice. And now Narada is really trying to wake him up to the reality of what will happen to him in the future if he doesn't change his ways. <laughs> So here we continue, this is verse number 26, chapter 4, chapter, Canto 4, chapter 28. Nice and loud. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Tam Yagya Luna Kuda kuda, 
Smaranto mi vad asyatat Smaranto mi vad asyatat Tam yagya pasavo nena Tam yagya pasavo nena Sam gyapta ye dayaluna Sam gyapta ye dayaluna Kutaraish chit chidu kru kruda Smaranto mi vam asyatat Smaranto mi vam asyatat Tam yagya pasavo nena Tam yagya pasavo nena Sam gyapta ye dayaluna Sam gyapta ye dayaluna Kutarais chedhidu kruda Smaranto mi vad asyatat Smaranto mi Tam jana pasavonena Tam jana pasavonena Sam japta ye dayaluna Sam japta ye dayaluna Kutara es chichuta chichuti chichitu krutha Kutara es chichitu krutha Smaranto mi vam asyayata Smaranto mi vam asyata Anyone else? <laughs> Tam. Him. Yagya Pasava. The sacrificial animals. Anena. By him. Samgyata. Killed. Yea. All of them. Who? Adaya Luna. By the most unkind, Kutarai, by axes, Chichidu, pierced to pieces, Kruda, being very angry, Smarata, remembering, Amivam, sinful activity, Asya, of him, Tat. That <clears throat> that most unkind king, Parunjana, had killed many animals in various sacrifices. Now taking advantage of this opportunity, all these animals began to pierce him with their horns. It was as though they were being cut to pieces by axes. I'm sorry, it was as though he was being cut to pieces by axes. Hmm. Those who are very enthusiastic about killing animals in the name of religion or for food must await similar punishment after death. The word mamsa meat indicates those animals whom we've killed will be given an opportunity to kill us. <clears throat> Although in actuality no living entity is killed, the pains of being pierced by the horns of animals will be experienced after death. 
Not knowing this, rascals unhesitatingly go on killing poor animals. So-called human civilization has opened many slaughterhouses for animals in the name of religion or food. Those who are little religious kill animals in temples, mosques, or synagogues, synagogues, and those who are more fallen maintain various slaughterhouses. Just, in, just, as in an, just as in civilized human society, the law is a life for a life. No living entity can encroach upon another living entity as far as the Supreme Lord is concerned. Everyone should be given freedom to live at the cost of the Supreme Father. And animal killing, either for religion or for food, is always condemned by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In Bhagavad Gita 16, 19, Lord Krishna says, Tanaham drisayam guram samsareshu naradamam shipyadyajam asubam asuryameva yoni shu. Those who are envious and mischievous, who are the lowest among men, are cast by me in the ocean of material existence into various demoniac species of life. Unquote. The animal killers, Dvishata, envying other living entities in the Supreme Power Personality of Godhead, and pl is, are placed in darkness and cannot understand the theme and objective of life. This is further explained in the following verses. Umagyan timiranda syagina jana salakaya chaksun militam yena tasmai shri gurvenu maha namam vishnu padaya krishna pristaya bhutale shrimakti bhakti vedanta swami tinamine namaste saraswati deve gauravani pacharye Nirvasesa sunyavadi pasyatya de satarinai Panchakopa turu vischa kripa sindhu ve vicha Patita nam pavane bio vaishnave bio namaho namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Siva Sri Gauravakta Vindam Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. In order to make a point for those who cannot directly accept the direct statements, <laughs> then analogies sometimes use in order to bring about a certain uh, message. And this is what is being here. Um, we can use it in a general sense that sometimes we talk about a person by talking about them, but not directly to them. It's, just, it's a way of making the message without implicating them, we're talking directly and saying that they are actually what we're talking about. It's a way of somehow may, getting your message through, but at the same time, knowing that the person cannot take it directly. So using this type of third person statement, talking about someone else or talking in general, but pointing it at the situation that is right in front of them. This is, a, this is what Narada is doing here. This king is very proud of his position, and he's also very proud that he has achieved such recognition as being expert at Kamrakanda, killing animals in Vedic sacrifices. But Narada knows that he's just compiling his bad karma. There is a thing called mamsa, it's mentioned here in the purport. Mamsa means, um, actually it's explained in detail, Mamsa is for those who want to eat meat, but still want to follow the Vedic regulations in order to stay within the context of religious principles. So Mamsa is that on a full moon night, a person will kill an animal, usually a goat, 
And before they kill the animal, they whisper or they speak to the goat saying, my dear Mr. Goat, I am about to kill you now and eat you, but soon in your next life, you will kill me and eat me. Sorry, Bo. <laughs> so, uh, it's not very... So this mantra is, is uh, a standard for those who want to eat meat and stay within the Vedic culture. So it's the idea of discouraging, because when you hear that, you know, you'll get a chance to be killed by the same living entity that you killed in another life, and you might hesitate and decide to give up your, you know, program. So the Vedic culture knows that there are people who like illicit sex, intoxication, meat eating, and they will not stop no matter what. <laughs> so to help them make a little progress towards uh, getting free from these things, things are sanctioned in a certain way. Um, and these three, especially illicit sex, intoxication, and meat eating, there are rules and regulations that people can engage in in order to, you know, carry out these sinful activities in order for them to yeah, enjoy some kind of sense gratification, at least theoretically. So that is the mercy of the Vedic culture. That it, it knows it can't tell people to stop, they won't stop. So rather than let them go directly to hell with sinful activities, they give them an opportunity to do it under certain religious regulations. And that's what's being, and that's what King Prajinabarhi was doing. But even that require, causes one to have to suffer in the future. As Prabhupada mentions here, these same animals that he killed will appear after his next life and in his, in his subtle body, before he gets his next gross body, they will appear to him and cut him to pieces. <laughs> it's on the subtle level, but it's still painful. Just like when we dream, we're entering into a subtle level of existence. We also may experience uh, horror, pain, pleasure on the subtle level in dream states also. So that's what's really happening here. So these animals will appear to him on the subtle level and cause him horrific types of mental pain. He's feeling he's being cut to pieces by these uh, horns and these animals that are just, you know, paying back his karma. And he's suffering, but his body is not, there's, he doesn't have a body. Mm -hmm. He has only, he's, he's within the mind and the consciousness of mind, intelligence, and false ego. But he's still experiencing this pain on the subtle level. Mental pain is just as miserable as physical pain. In fact, it's even worse. <laughs> And so, this is what's happening here. So, when Prabhupada wants to make a point that, you know, this animal killing goes on quite profusely, particularly in today's society. Um, countries like India, Argentina, Brazil, China, and also the U.S. are some of the leading countries that are engaged in slaughterhouses. Now you can imagine how much suffering there is. Just like uh, we have our uh, Manjuwali here, she's from Croatia. And about, it was December 29, 19, no, not 19, December 29, 2021. I was sitting in my room in Ljubljana, 
which is uh, 150 miles away, there was an earthquake. A very devastating earthquake. And what was the name of that city? Hmm? And no, it wasn't Virovitsa, it was Koprinitsa? Not Koprinitsa. Mm -hmm. Katrina. Petrina. Petrina. Petrina, yeah. 150 miles away, and my room was shaking. <laughs> Heavy earthquake. And many people died, and half the city was destroyed. That city was a big slaughterhouse place. <laughs> Animals were being killed quite regularly, especially chickens. They were killing chickens and other animals as a franchise in order to sell the meat for money. Uh, that city was always known as a place for slaughterhouse, and so there was this earthquake, and it just, I mean, it was devastating. Many people died, but the whole place got almost, almost, almost level to the ground, the whole city. <laughs> So there's heavy reactions in coming from material energy. And even some today, even today, there are some philanthropists who are not actually engaged in spiritual activity, but they see the connection between wars and animal killing. And that is George Bernard Shaw, a famous, uh, what we say, what would we call him, a person who preaches moral principles. Anyway, he wrote one poem explaining that, you know, we sit down and we at our tables and we gorge ourselves on the dead bodies of animals, but we don't understand, actually see that uh, the results of such things, it's very poetic is actually war. And Prabhupada also has mentioned that so many times, that there's so many problems in the world, and one of the biggest causes of problems is wanton animal killing. And of course now, of course also killing babies in the womb too. Many countries have allowed that as to go on as a way for people to have some kind of theoretical freedom. But what about the child? <laughs> it's a living being. Life starts at conception, not at a certain level of pregnancy. Some of these uh, philosophers say that, well, or these uh, scientists say, life doesn't begin in the womb until the seventh month. <laughs> but how is it growing if it's, there's no... <laughs> If there's no life there, how does it grow? <laughs> Conception is the actual beginning of life. As soon as the, the womb is fertilized, then uh, the soul enters into the womb and that it starts to develop and then the body gradually, and after nine months, it becomes, and it can be, actually takes birth. So they have all their own theory, and then they think animals, they also say, we even hear from many religious organizations, animals have no souls. <laughs> but what is the symptom of life is consciousness. And they say, well, you know, we, they say it's intelligence, therefore animals are not very intelligent, therefore they have no soul. And Prabhupada would respond, well, even little babies don't have, you know, developed intelligence, but that doesn't mean that they're not living, <laughs> and that, that they are not living beings, spiritual beings. So that what goes on in order to sanction all of this sinful activity in the name of economic development is uh, a heavy, heavy karma on the world. And people wonder why there's so much suffering in the world. A lot of it's due, a good portion of it's due to killing animals and killing children, like that. And here it, it explains that this idea of animal killing, Prabhupada makes this point in this verse, is based on the principle of envy. It's interesting. Uh, envy is 
um, there's something about you I don't like, or something about you that I want that you have. So I don't like you for whatever reason, because you're better than me, or you're more successful than me, or something about you causes me to feel unhappy because of what you are. Now well, that's envy. And uh, so Prabhupada says the living entity falls to the material world from the spiritual world because of envy. And that envy starts with enviousness of the Supreme Lord. And then it takes part in this material world where people envy each other in different ways. And uh, so I don't like the idea that you live and I and that you're living, so I kill you. That's envy. <laughs> and so Prabhupada makes this point. They're envious of animals. Every and Prabhupada makes this point here very strongly that everyone is given the right to life by the Supreme Lord. And one cannot encroach upon another person's <coughs> right to life without getting a reaction upon that. Just like sometimes people think killing ins insects are, is okay, you know. But God has given that particular soul, a particular body, according to its evolutionary progress up to the scale of ultimately human life. And if one mistakenly or even purposely kills an insect, that living entity is supposed to stay in that body for so many years and therefore you cut short or so many minutes or whatever you cut short that person's that living entity's existence in that body that means that living entity has to take birth again in that same body to live out that particular species of life <laughs> so and of course, now in other words, you're interfering with God's natural progression for the living entities to evolve to higher stages and ultimately get a chance for human life where they can practice spiritual life. <laughs> so, sometimes devotees think it's okay, but it's not. <laughs> of course, devotees are not like that. They don't kill anything. Bodhis would ask the other problem, but, but sometimes we're painting the wall and then we paint over a bug or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> so what about that? Prabhupada said if you're engaged in devotional service, then you're no longer responsible for accidentally, and that word has to be, you know, emphasized, killing a living entity. But if you do it purposely, that's another thing. So we're walking along the floor, and sometimes we step on a bug, we don't know. But if you're engaged in devotional service, then uh, that bug gets some benefit, <laughs> <laughs> getting stepped on by a devotee. <laughs> and you also don't get a reaction for that. <laughs> but if you, you know, are not engaged in devotional service and say you're going to the movies <laughs> and you're walking along the road <laughs> and then every bug you step on there's a reaction that will come in one form or another in the future <laughs> and so this is how intricate and how finely tuned life is there is a very systematic organization of how life goes on and it's all of it's orchestrated ultimately by the Supreme Lord through the material energy. And if one knows how to live, even from the point of view of pious activities, one can avoid a lot of the difficulties of life. But ultimately, even piety will somehow or other gravitate down to lower levels of existence due to the combination of the modes of material energy and that man, that's mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita that the modes are always in composition from for each other so one cannot even stay in the mode of goodness even if one tries because the modes of passion and ignorance especially in this age are very prominent yeah that example of uh, King Nirga 
It's mentioned in the Bhagavatam. Very pious, religious king. And uh, he had many, many, he liked to give in charity. That was his whole thing. Especially to the brahmanas. So he would give like thousands of cows to different brahmanas. And he did this regularly, and he was known as a very pious and religious king. So one day, he gave 1,000 cows to one brahmana. <laughs> and then another brahmana came along, and he gave another 1,000 cows to that second brahmana. Now one of the cows that he gave to the first brahmana wandered back into his herd and he gave it mistakenly to that second brahmana again. So then the brahmanas were saying, well, this cow is my cow because he gave it to me. And the other one was saying, no, he actually gave it to me. <laughs> so they were kind of like fighting over this cow. <laughs> because it says that brahman's possession is like, you know, sacred. <laughs> So they were quarreling over it, and King Nirga said, well, he tried to settle it. He said, he said to the first Brahmin, I'll give you another thousand cows. He said, no, that's not the point. That's my cow. You gave me my cow. And so there was no argument, it was, wasn't settled, and they both went away very unhappy. Jai Shri Shri Gurnitai. And so, when King Nirga died, Yamaraj came to him and said, Do you want the results of your pious activities first or your impious activities? So he was thinking, What is my impious activities? I never did anything wrong. And then that was explained that. Because you had offended a brahmana, therefore you have to suffer for that reaction. His idea was not to offend, but he did because there was some misunderstanding and some quarrel. They came and nothing was settled. So he mistakenly said, well, give me my, uh, give me my impious activities first, which was small compared to his pious activities. So he had to take birth as a lizard. And then the story goes on, of course, one day some of Krishna's sons were playing in that area and they were playing ball and they, uh, the ball fell into the well and that same Nirga now in the form of a lizard was living in that well. And so when they couldn't get the ball out of the well, Krishna, the father of the two boys, came along and said, he said, could you get the ball out for us? So he reached down and then he grabbed the lizard also. <laughs> and he picked him up and he changed him back into a, I think a Gandharva or some form. He got a, he got a human form again. But he had to suffer in that lizard birth for at least one life. So this story kind of illustrates how finely tuned the uh, the energy of the material world is. That even a slight deviation can cause just a, a little bit of a an offense. So, but when one takes to devotional service, of course, one becomes aware of these things. And even if one accidentally commits an offense, it can be overshadowed by the process of devotional service. Otherwise, people are responsible for everything they do. And in that way, you can imagine why the collective karma on the planet is gradually going down and down and down. Every planet has a collective karma. It said that, and also countries have karma, collective karma too. So people take birth in a particular country and in a particular species of life, particular body, particular family, according to the karma that they are, in, you know, must accept in their next life. 
So when people become very sinful, then the whole collective karma of the planet or the country starts to gravitate down. And then lower living entities coming from other planets start taking birth in that same area and then the whole planet starts to go down and down and down. So Prabhupada said this earth planet is a middle planet. There is a balance of piety and impiety, but now we're seeing that piety is becoming less and impiety is becoming more and more in the name of, in the name of material progress. And in many countries are sanctioning illicit sex, intoxication, meat eating, gambling, and many types of horrific forms of lifestyles in order just to please people's desire for sense gratification and to become popular amongst the people. So, so you can go to different places and you'll see the collective karma. You ever, you've heard of uh, Sarusati? You must have heard of Sar Sarusati? Sarasati, Sarasati. That's, Sati means pure fire. Purification by fire, sadasati. And it's an astrological period where a, different countries go through this sadasati. And it's a seven and a half year astrological period where if the, car, if the country is generally pious, then the results of that pious activity is delivered and people gain some, you know, material benefits from that. But if it's sinful, then they get the reactions to that also. So America right now is going through its saddle sati. <laughs> Just in case you want to know what's happening. India also is going through its sada sada sati also right now. So yeah, it's it's just so people. So this is how finely tuned material energy is. Even astrological arrangements in the heavenly planets affect everything, even on this level. <laughs> so if you understand that everything is so finely tuned that you can't move away without getting either a pious or impious reaction for everything you do. And, but even if your consciousness is not right, <clears throat> that's if you're not a devotee. <laughs> well, of course, it mentions in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, because Kali Yuga is so bad, <laughs> and people are generally sinful, that if you think of something pleasant, or doing good to others, or pious, you get the benefit by thinking in that way. But if you think of something wrong, bad, inauspicious, sinful, because of Kali Yuga, you don't get a reaction for that. But don't take advantage of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's mentioned in the first canto, 18th chapter, verse number 7, you can read it. Uh, uh, yeah, because of the nature of this age, and everything is so degraded that it's, it's impossible, practically, even for devotees to be free from, you know, the effects of sinful mentalities that come by way of the atmosphere. Just like if you're in a place that is very degraded or sinful, you may also pick up that energy which will affect your consciousness, unless you're very strong in Krishna consciousness, then you're not deter disturbed by that. But if you think of something good, if you, like, if you think of doing some pious activity to someone, or if you, just, you want to do some devotional service, even devotional service in the mind counts. <laughs> But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it <laughs> on the physical level. What it means is that if you don't, say you're disabled or sick or you can't get around, something, in other words, you're not able to do the physical activity. If you perform the same activity in the mind, it's just as 
just as beneficial like that. That's the glories of devotional service. Now we're hearing a little bit about, you know, um, the effects of, of apparently karmakanda activities, which are somewhat sanctioned in the Vedas, but still there's a reaction there. But for those who don't follow any rules or any regulations, then they're completely under the control of the material energy, and there is heavy reactions for that. So for devotees, devotees have to be careful because padam padam yavi padam, this age is very difficult. Even devotees can somehow or other be victimized by the, the negative qualities of this age. If you, especially if you get the wrong association. Always stay in association of devotees. If you have to associate with the non-devotees to carry on personal affairs, then always keep your consciousness very much connected to Krishna. Or don't get involved with any kind of activity outside of taking care of business. <laughs> the devotees talk about association. And we say that we should associate only with devotees, but then we ask us, we say, well, we have to go to the store and buy things. Some of us have occupational, we have to work with people who are materialists. But the idea of association is defined in two words, affection for. If you develop affection for that individual, then there is association. But if there's no affection, there's no association. Affection means to come on the same mind level. Just like if the non-devotees start talking about how nice it is to go to parties and get intoxicated, and you think, oh, he's a nice guy. <laughs> I'll listen to him. Then you're in trouble. <laughs> So we should, and we should develop affection for devotees and share Krishna consciousness together. And that kind of association builds relationships and it also brings us closer to Krishna. But if we develop affection for the non-devotees, then when we are in a, in a mood of gravitating our consciousness down towards... But you know, sometimes we say, well, we have to preach. We're in association of these persons. But then Prabhupada said, then give them your association and don't let them take, don't take their association. That means you have something to give, not something to receive. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot of, we can go into this more and more. So I'm going to stop here. My classes have been two hours every class, so I thought, <laughs> thought I'd make it a little shorter today. Because... <laughs> Last night was an hour and a half. Yesterday morning was two hours. So, so um, I don't know. Maybe you like two-hour classes, but it's, I think we have to go on with other activities today. So, any questions, comments, or anything? Yes, Drew. Do we have a microphone? Sages at Nami Saranya didn't have this problem. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the class, Maharaj. Um, sorry, my English is not. Uh, but uh, in Brazil, around uh, 2017, they have a, a football team. They have and what? They have what? Football team. Football team. Who does? Brazilians. Oh, the Brazilians. From Brazil. If you talk real slow, then I can understand you. Okay. And this team football mm. is a new team, and they are become uh, very prominent. Become? Very famous, yes. Conquer, conquer champions. The Brazilian football team is the best. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> And this team, uh, in a flight, 
this flying to found out and all, all players died. Only one or two players survived. It was a plane crash? Yes. Mm -hmm. And this football team came from South, the came Brazil from South. Yes. Came from where? South. South. The South place in Brazil. Southern place. Southern yeah. Brazil. And the name of this team is Chapecoense because it came from the city of Chapeco. What have in Chapeco? Chapeco have one of the most biggest slater houses in Brazil. Biggest slaughterhouses in Brazil. Yeah, especially they produce uh, big meat. Uh. And the... Uh, <laughs> Sorry for that. The, the, <laughs> the, the main sponsor of this team, of this city, it was uh, this Slater house. Oh, yes. sponsor. The slaughterhouse sponsored the team? Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the business of this city, Chapeco, is this is later house. It's most famous by, by the meat pig mm -hmm. in Brazil. And the, this, this later house sponsored this, this team. And this team, simple? Yeah. Dial. This is one example of many of how the reactions of it killing living entities for no reason. And then uh, it's like when you get an infection in your body, if you don't take care of it, it grows into something more dangerous and actually it turn, maybe even turns into an, a visible sore and if it can become so bad it actually has, to, and then you have to use very strong medicines so in the same way, when we start, when the living entities, in an organized way, start killing animals, you don't see anything happening in the beginning. But as it build, as the karma builds up, it's more like the disease is getting stronger, and then at one set point, it comes and destroys the whole body. So that's how karma works. So people can't just connect it because things work just like, for example, how karma works. Uh, after the battle of Kurukshetra, Dhritarashtra, a blind king for the, uh, the Kurus, he's, uh, he had a hundred sons headed by Diodna. They were all killed. And uh, he was born blind. So he came to Krishna and said to Krishna, Krishna, can you tell me my karma? I had a hundred sons and they were all killed and I was born blind. <coughs> so, you know, what did I do? <laughs> and Krishna responded by saying, 50 lives ago, 50, you were a hunter and you shot a flaming arrow into a nest of birds and there were a hundred birds in the nest and they all died and the mother bird got away but she was blinded by the fire. <laughs> so Dhritarashtra was shocked to hear that. But then he responded, 50 lives. Why 50 lives ago I got this reaction now after 50 lives? And Krishna said, to have a son he requires good karma. And so it took you 50 lives to build up enough good karma where you had a hundred sons and then the, your, the reactions of your sinful activities cashes in. So people can't see that. There was that famous book that was written many years ago in America why do bad things happen to good people? And maybe some of us who've been around for a while remember that book. It was the number one bestseller ever in the history of bestseller books. It seemed to answer the question everybody had because it was written by a rabbi, a man of God, who had a 
son who was born, and he was born with this very rare disease called progeria, where you go through your whole life quickly. And so the boy died of old age at 14 years old. Of very rare disease. It originated in Africa. And uh, so he was thinking, I'm a man of God, and this is an innocent boy. Why did this happen? So he was thinking, well, God is good, yes. He's all good, we know that. But still, he couldn't explain this. So then he thought, well, maybe, you know, God may be all good, but he's, he's not all powerful. So that was his conclusion. And then he wrote a book based on that, that God wants to help you, but there's so many things going on. And he's got so many living entities to look after, he mentioned misses a few once in a while. That was his conclusion. And then he wrote based on that, that God, we have to remember God is good. He's our loving father. But, you know, he's busy. <laughs> <laughs> he's not only, you know, having to take care of us, he's got other things to do also. <laughs> so he misses a few things. And that seemed for people in general, and even theolo theolo theologians, theolo theologians, they like that answer. Yes, here's the answer. Why good things, bad things happen to good people. It's because, you know, God's very busy and he misses a few of us. And so now we understand it. So that book was a bit. And we wrote a, Saru, uh, Verinda Sarup wrote a reaction article to that and saying, bad things don't happen, good things don't happen to bad people. Bad, thing, good thing, bad things happen to bad people. <laughs> and good things happen to good people. But the whole principle of reincarnation and that the soul gets its reaction in another body for something that happened many lives ago, or maybe even in the previous life. And we can't see that. So then, uh, you know, of course, I don't know if any, how many people read our reaction to the, his book, because... So that's, you know, so karma works in such a way. Imagine a silo. You know the silo always where you keep grains, you know, in the farm. And if you're husking the grains, you put them into the silo on the top. And then you have a door on the bottom if you want to get it. You open it up and you get it. So the grains that you put on the top will take a while before you actually, you know, get those grains. But what's coming out is immediate. So, and then the question also comes, why does good things happen to bad people? <laughs> Is that in previous lives, they're getting their reactions in this life, in the same way for, for those who are apparently good, but getting some bad reactions. So reactions don't always come directly. There's four kinds of karma. <laughs> Instant karma, mass karma, mass karma, the plane crash, that's mass karma. Uh, what is the other one too? Mm, I always forget the names of these karmas. Prarabdha karma. Huh? karma. Yeah, that's probably up to, that's karma that is manifesting now, yeah, par parabdha. But it's, I'm using more or less English terminology to I can't think of it. But you take birth based on a particular karma that builds up so many, what is it called? I, I can't think of the names now. But if 27 of these particular types of karma builds up and then that together brings your birth into a particular family, country, society, gender, everything like that. Manifest karma. There's manifest karma, mass karma, um, instant, instant karma, you know, right? You say something to somebody and they don't like it and they say something back to you. 
<laughs> you punch somebody and he punches you back. <laughs> you say something nice to somebody, he smiles and gives you a nice similar return. That's instant karma. <laughs> and uh, designated karma, yeah. And then these are, these are different activities that s sort of formulate our consciousness which manifests at the time of death and then we get a particular body like that. Mass karma is like when plane crashes, tornadoes, or many people die because of one, enduring one situation, that's mass karma. So the material energy just collects all of these living entities, puts them in one place, and then the karma. So we're always controlled, we're always controlled. So the question is, to be controlled by material energy or to be controlled by Krishna. <laughs> so we have a choice. And so you can't be half controlled by Krishna and half controlled by material <laughs> energy. Devotees sometimes think, you know, I'm better to have two masters instead of one. <laughs> but it's not easy to serve two masters because they both are opposite. Yes, question, uh, uh, Nayana. Yeah, um, I told you all we are doing a self-sufficient farm and uh, doing, a, doing agriculture and gardening and uh, yeah, sometimes we have to kill bugs mm. because if we don't uh, get rid of them, then they are eating our food. So how, yeah, what is going on in this case? Well, you should do your best not to do that, but if you're doing it as a devotional service, then... <laughs> but if you're doing it for your own backyard, good luck. <laughs> of course, you're, because you're a devotee, you're going to take whatever you cultivate in your garden, cook it and offer it to Krishna, so... Like I mean, I am chanting, I mean, we are chanting when we kill them, but we are very, <laughs> we are very sorry to do that. I mean, I hate to do that, but if we don't do Jiva, it, Jiva, Sajivanam. You can't live without killing. It happens automatically. But those who are engaged in devotional service, they're not, they don't get reactions for that. But those who are not, they're getting reactions for that. Okay, so... But try to avoid it as best you can. Yeah, we we are getting ducks who will eat them for us. I mean, uh, who will kill them for us. <laughs> it's just when you're breathing, you're killing germs. I mean, it's just that's why the Jains they wear the masks, you know. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't do anything. <laughs> so Prabhupada says, breathe for Krishna, you know. <laughs> In other words, do everything as an offering to the Lord and then there's no reactions. Because you can't stop killing, it's just the way it is. And, you know, doctors, when they're, you know, administrating, when they do surgery or when they do various types of medicine applications, they're also killing germs. Killing, you can't stop. It's just the way it is. But we should try to avoid it. If we can, if we can't, then make sure everything is done as a service to the Lord. And then you're free from those reactions. Yeah, do your best. <coughs> yes? Mm -hmm. And once you mentioned the connection to manifest karma, something with 27? 27 designated karmas become a manifest karma. Manifest karma is usually your birth. So you're building up these certain karmas that are certain, formulating a certain consciousness which will determine your next person. And so these karmas, in a collective sense, formulate what kind of body you will achieve, who will be your parents, what country you're born in, what gender, all of these things. So yeah, there was one devotee who did research on karma and came up with this this manifest karma, and, uh, designated karma, and then manifest karma. So manifest karma when something cashes in, like, like that. Like birth is manifest karma mm -hmm. from previous activities. And Where can we find this information? 
I have it on recording. It's not written. Because <laughs> you'll find hardly any books talking about... Krishna doesn't talk about karma either. When he was asked, can you explain karma, he says, it's too, too difficult to explain. <laughs> not for him, but it's too... It's very hard to understand how karma works. It's so intricate and so complicated and so precise that it's just, you know. Why is someone, you know, born in a certain situation? Why is someone born in another situation? What about twins? Even though there may be identical twins, there is some karmic difference there also, slightly. And that's how intricate karma is. <laughs> so I have a, a recorded lecture by this one devotee who did some really heavy research and came up with this, which I think is quite accurate. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. Possible to get that recorded? Uh, I have it on my cloud. You know what the cloud is? Something that floats in the sky. <laughs> 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 so I have to access the cloud and get that 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 lecture. And I forgot my cloud access because I have <laughs> I usually avoid clouds. I usually go for the sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll, uh, if you want, I'll do a little work and try to, you know, get some rainfall for you. <laughs> Is that okay? okay? It's interesting. This devotee is very, very intelligent. Um, he was a member of the Radha Gopinath temple for many years. Grihasta. <laughs> Brilliant. He's a man is brilliant. He's really brilliant. Okay. Yeah. And I had a question mm -hmm. about uh, you mentioned this point of association, mm -hmm. and you said uh, you beautifully said how we can summarize it as affection developing affection for. It. And a question came in my mind, which is about rather, parents. Hmm? About parents. No, not just parents, but it, it's a slightly daring question about um, when we associate with each other. Mm. And maybe it's not even, maybe it's very critical of me. But sometimes when you associate and um, you can observe there are certain things in uh, you don't want to associate with and there are certain things you want to associate with in devotees. Mm -hmm. And similarly, I also have certain things I don't want to give uh, association for. I do counseling all the time. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> yeah. You just see what I have to go through. <laughs> of course, they have to also tolerate me too. <laughs> so if you're preaching or if you're doing counseling, then that's just part of the service. You have to tolerate that. If you can help someone at the same time, then that's the service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have our doctor back there, you know. Yeah, she has to hang around diseased persons. <laughs> it's like, so it's an occupation. It does it to, to uh, in order for to help people get free from diseases. So you can't say, well, you're diseased, I don't want to associate with you. <laughs> well, you have these certain characteristics. But if you're working in a position of serving them in a certain way, then all you have to, you have to tolerate that and then go on with the service. If you develop, if it's just a casual thing, then you can avoid that. <laughs> If there's no real purpose for that rela relationship, then you can avoid that. If it's something social or something casual. But if it's part of your service, maybe as an occupation or in, in devotional service, then we just have to tolerate people's uh, anarchists. That's all.
and try to see them as a spirit soul who are who is covered with these wrong attitudes or certain characteristics that are now very pleasing. And try to see their see beyond what they are presenting. See them as a spiritual being. That's all. And that's that's actually seeing. Mm -hmm. But if it's not required, then you can avoid that, if you want. And of course, if you're working with people, then you also, there's certain ways to bring out their good qualities while you're trying to work with them. as part of counseling. Or, if there's some reason you have to associate in that way, then you should try to see the goal and how to achieve the goal and not so much worry about what it, what's happening when you need to get to the goal. So. But if you feel yourself going down because of that, you're becoming unhappy or you're becoming, feel like your mind's being somewhat disturbed by that, then you might have to do something to change. But a lot of times we just tolerate. Then you think, oh, people have to tolerate me too. <laughs> so. <laughs> Krishna has to tolerate us. <laughs> He's got to tolerate a lot of us. <laughs> so we should be a little tolerant of other people also. And not get so disturbed by other... Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati says something really interesting. He says, if the faults of others are causing you disturbance, look within yourself and find out what about yourself that's, that is causing you to become disturbed. Pretty interesting. The faults of others are causing you disturbance. Look within yourself and see why you're becoming, what about you, who you, that is causing you to become disturbed. Interesting. I mean, that's right to the point. <laughs> Where is that mentioned? Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati mentions that in his, there's a whole listing of his different quotes that are given. He, there's one 64 quotes, another one 25 quotes, some of his statements on devotional service. I think there's one book that was put out by Bhakti Tirtha Swami who lists the 64 quotes in there and he also gives some commentary on those quotes. Anything else? Yes, Mataji. <coughs> Similar thing with the Similar thing with the association and it affection. Yeah. But when it is with the children who are already grown ups and live their style of life, but still wants uh, and need affection, uh, because um, in them there is a little complaint because I, I neglected in them. them. There, is a there is a complaint, a complaint because I neglected them for many, many years when they were younger because of my spiritual activities. They want more of your time and attention. Yes, mm -hmm. but they don't, they are not devotees and they live their style. They are not vegetarians. Two of them, I have three children. They're grown up then. They are grown up, yeah. They have their own families, but mm -hmm. still they want attention and affection. From you. Yeah, <laughs> so how can I um, 
Bring him to the temple. <laughs> Tell him you want my affection, this is where you get it. <laughs> Or let's sit together and read Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> you get my full attention then. <laughs> Some spiritualize their desire to get your attention. That way you, you know, you're actually helping them. Otherwise, say you don't have any time. <laughs> That's true, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's important that when we're trying to help someone, we help someone in the way that they can actually benefit. Just to give them attention doesn't mean we're helping them. It's just, it's just pandering to their sentiments doesn't mean that they're benefiting by that. You know, on their birthday, send them a card. <laughs> Say. You can write, uh, Happy Birthday Hare Krishna. <laughs> Something like that. Remind them of who their mother is. Their mother is a devotee of God. And therefore, if you want to follow in the family tradition, you should also follow your mother. <laughs> Just by going there, just by going there, being for a short time with them, uh, going there with the, with the, with our energy of the devotee, because it, it doesn't uh, bring them any further somehow on the subtle right? Something, yeah, there's some benefit, but it's, if you give them prasadam, that's benefit. Yes, and if, even if they're, even if they're with you because you're a devotee, if they treat you properly, then they're actually getting some benefit because they're serving a devotee. Yeah, but because you're in a superior position being their mother, you know, you don't have to listen to them. <laughs> they won't listen to you because they're grown up, right? Because they think, you know, I, I gave up that years ago. But what can you do? Family members always take advantage of each other. It's unfortunate. All right, good luck. <laughs> and pray to Krishna. If you pray to Krishna, you'll also get his mercy. Yeah, anything else? Okay. No more? Okay, thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. So today, tonight we have a program in Langenthal. So if you want to join us there. So it starts at five? Theoretically. IST, Indian stretch time. <laughs> <laughs> You know all about that. <laughs> if you're two hours late, you're on time. <laughs> After two hours, you're late. Tell us, Shalom Alaikum, Jai.